from the San Francisco Bay Area. This is Athletics Talk Now with Dale Tafoya, one of the fastest growing podcasts about your Oakland A's. Join us as we celebrate the past and embrace the future of A's baseball. Let's jump right into the action with author, host, and journalist Dale Tafoya. His pitchers and catchers report to spring training on February 14th. And around the first of the year, we start to sniff the return of baseball. It is Wednesday, January 8th, 2014, and 2013 was a great year for the A's and for our podcast. You know, there's nothing like delving into the history of a storied and celebrated franchise like the Oakland A's. And it's equally exciting to explore the future of this organization, one of the most progressive thinking in all of baseball. And I don't take this responsibility lightly. When I first started this podcast in August of 2010, I did it for you, A's fan. Before the A's forged forged an agreement with their current flagship, the A's hardly had any coverage on their former station that aired their games. In fact, I remember during that time of limbo, fans were forced to listen to a few spring training games online. As a fan who grew up listening to A's talk on the radio, I understand the importance of fans receiving their fix about their favorite team. That's why I will continue to provide commercial-free, undiluted A's talk. A's fans are some of the most passionate and intelligent in all of baseball. You deserve it. Welcome, Oakland A's fans around the globe. This is a special episode of Athletics Talk Now. We're a podcast that celebrates the past and embraces the future of A's baseball. This is podcast number 123. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at at Dale Tafoya. That's at D-A-L-E-T-A-F-O-Y-A. And don't forget to visit our site, athleticstalknow.com. You know, former A's manager Tony La Russa was recently unanimously elected to the Hall of Fame on December 9th. La Russa finished with the third most wins by a manager with 2,728. He managed the A's for about nine and a half seasons. He was manager manager of the year, AL manager of the year, in 1988 and 1992 while with the A's. And you'd think Tony would get more praise from A's fans. But every once in a while, you hear some, some grumble. With all that talent, he only won one World Series. <laughs> and joining me to talk a few minutes about LaRusse's legacy with the A's is his former workhorse and ace pitcher with the A's, Dave Stewart. Stu, first of all, Happy New Year, and what was your first impression of La Russa when he was hired to replace former manager Jackie Moore in the middle of that season in 1986? You know, I didn't know very much about him. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I saw him from across the field um, when he was managing the White Sox, um, but really didn't know a lot about him um, when he uh, when he uh, initially came to the ball club. Stu, what Hello? was your... What was your relationship uh, like with Tony? I mean, you were his ace, ace pitcher and go-to starter. You started game one of every World Series from 1988 to 90. It must have felt nice that he had that much confidence in you. You know, we, we recently had a, an opportunity to, to talk about the decision-making in, in, uh, in his mind and Dunk's mind um, and me starting uh, for him the first game uh, managing the ball club. You know, he had uh, he had told me that um, he and Dunk were looking at the at the, the possibilities, and um, he told me that he liked the way that I competed. He saw me in Texas. And, um, he said that he he liked the way that I competed um, while I was playing for the Rangers. Um, and you know that played into to the to the first part of the decision. But um, I mean, the the real truth of the matter is, after you know having an opportunity to play for him. Uh, for the years that I was in Oakland, um, I you know I played for some some good ones. I I, I thought that Tony that uh, that uh, Tommy Lasorda was was a was a quality manager and did a great job. Um, we, um, in 1981, won a World Series with Tommy. Um, after you know playing with Tommy, and then in hindsight having an opportunity to play for uh, Cito Gaston. And sure. the thing that impressed me most about Tony is is, is, is preparation. And not not that these the, the other two, uh, Tommy or, or Cito, weren't prepared, but you no, know, Tony put, put a, a different stamp on it and, and and brought it to a different level. And um, I think that's why he was so successful as a manager winning baseball games because 
there weren't very many situations that he didn't think about and that he hadn't thought about. And by doing that, it, it put him in a, in, a, in a situation where he was prepared for whatever took place during the game. You know, Stu, sometimes you hear the word genius attached to La Russa. Was he a, more of a genius or a grinder? Um, I, I think a combination of both. I mean, I don't remember uh, before Tony um, there being um, the, the, the different um, situational pitching um, arrangements um, with other ball clubs where you, you, you have a lefty, lefty, righty, righty, um, and then go to the closer. I don't remember that very much um, before playing for Tony. Um, and so, I mean, that, that actually changes – the game, um, and it, it actually brought more importance to your middle relievers and your setup guys and ultimately um, your closer. And, you know, I attribute that to Tony. Um, and so there is a bit of genius in that, but, I mean, he's very, very competitive, um, very competitive. And there were a lot of games when he felt he needed to rest, uh, what we would call our A squad, and we'd send, we'd send our B squad out there and um, – you know, he would figure out ways to to manufacture runs and for us to win games. Um, you know, and if it was a high-scoring game, you know, he'd figure out a way to maneuver our bullpen and work our bullpen um, to shut the other guys down so we could win a game. So, you know, that's the nine part of him, but the genius part of him is, is, changing, um, is changing the game in the way that, um, the way that um, it was presented to, to the fans. Yeah, it was definitely uh, he definitely shortened the game. You would go seven seven innings, and then the honey cuts and the Gene Nelsons would come, and of course Eck would just close the door in the ninth. I mean, it, it was it was amazing how he was able to, to get it done. Um, and like I said, we were really really successful in, in what we did as a ball club, and and how he ran the club. Uh, his communication with the players um, uh, pre game. You know, he spent time talking to every individual um, pre-game. Um, what he talked about with me was, I'm sure, different than what he talked about with Dave Henderson versus Dennis Eckersley versus Ricky Henderson. You know, having conversations with every player, understanding what um, to expect on that given day. You know, sometimes people forget, Stu, uh, just like you and Dennis Eckersley and others resurrected their careers in Oakland, Tony, Tony La Russa himself resurrected his managerial career when he arrived in Oakland in, in the middle of that 1986 season. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he had been, he had been fired um, in, in, in uh, Chicago. And he, at that time, he was still very, very young in his career. And, you know, um, I guess most people would probably say he had minimal, minimal success in Chicago, but... You know, I'm one of those guys that you also have to look at at, the, at, at what you put on the field, um, and that sometimes doesn't always reflect the guy that, that's running the baseball team. Um, but, you know, Tony stepped into the business very, very young um, uh, when he got his first manager's job. And, you know, through the years, um, with the notes that he put on, on his uh, line of cards, he learned a lot, and he recalled a lot, and it brought him to – Ultimately, what he is right now, a Hall of Famer. And, of course, Stu, you have some critics that say, well, he had the poster boys of steroids on his A's teams, Conseco McGuire, and they helped him win all those games. How would you ad address those critics, Stu? Well, I mean, personally, that didn't have anything to do with it. I mean, we, other than, we had other other players uh, than Jose Conseco and, Mark McGuire. Um, we had we had that's just two of twenty five players. Um, we had, in my opinion, and I don't think anybody would dispute this. At that time, we had one of the premier pitching staffs in all of baseball. Um, and then, you know, when you look at the Ricky Hendersons, the Dave Hendersons, the Carney Lansfords, Terry Steinbach, along with Ron Hassey, Walter Weiss, and when you put together the whole package, um, at that time, McGuire, who was a part of the ball club, and Conseco, who was a part of the ball club, but those guys were only a, a, a piece of what factored into us winning the amount of games and ultimately winning the World Series. 
No, Stu, you're, one of your clients, uh, you're an agent right now, is Matt Kemp, and McGuire is the obviously the hitting coach for the Dodgers. What's your relation, relationship like with Big Mac these days? Um, well, obviously not like it was when we were teammates, but <clears throat> Mac and I, we've had an opportunity to talk on a few occasions. Um, we don't talk on a regular basis. We've had some conversations uh, involving Mac and, and suggestions in, in how to get the best out of him. Um, but past that, uh, I've had minimal minimal conversation with uh, with Big Mac. Mm. Stu, as always, thanks for your time, and once again, Happy New Year. Thank you, and Happy New Year to you. That's Dave Stewart, as always a class act, and uh, moving right along, I have Rick Tittle on the line with us. He's a longtime Ace fan and host of Ace Talk on the weekends on the Ace flagship station, 95.7 The Game. Uh, sounds like you have a dream job, Rick. Well, it's not a dream job to follow Stu. I mean, if you're Eckersley, that's one thing, but uh, yeah, love Smoke, man. He's, he's one of my all-time favorites, St. Elizabeth High, but uh, no, listen, it's... Uh, it's never lost on me the fact that I get to uh, every now and then host the, uh, the the pre and post game show because it's a show that I called up as a as a little kid way back in the day. So uh, I mean I'm I think I'm the only guy there that's born and raised uh, you know uh, A's fan. So I, I don't take it lightly. Mm, and so when A's talk, I remember I used to call into Ron Barr KSFO. Was same with you, Rick? Uh, I used to, yes, before that, Scotty Sterling did it, and then uh, you know Ron Barr did a little bit. That's right, and um, then that went into. I remember Rich Herrera did it for a while before mm-hmm. Blount, uh, Robert Blount took over. And uh, but uh, yeah, I mean it's it's great for the the fans to have their say. Although I'm I'm uh, I'm highly critical of the team. I think it's because I am a fan, which I think gets me into trouble sometimes because I I hold the team to a championship standard, and and I hold pro athletes to a really high standard. I give no excuses, so sometimes I'm a little bit hard on them. <laughs> Speaking of that team, Rick, we're in 2014, but let's talk about last season. Uh, after the 2011 season, the A's traded Gio Gonzalez and Trevor Kale for a bunch of B-listers, and it looked like the organi- organization was trying to rebuild. Suddenly, they have two postseason appearances under their belt. Since then, how would you compare last season to others in A's history? Well, last season they didn't sneak up on anybody because they were the best team in baseball from the midpoint on. I think even before that, I think from like June 1st. So uh, everybody knew they were coming, and um, they were rebuilding after those trades. There was no doubt. Billy Bean said it himself. He said, we can't compete with Anaheim's and and Texas's TV money. There's no reason to spend money to finish third, so we're going to rebuild. But then Bob Melvin came in and was able to take those teams to heights, and that's why I thought it was ludicrous that Billy Bean would get executive of the year when he was waving a white flag. But hey, if you win, everybody loves you, no matter what happens. But um, yeah, last season was fantastic, as I said, because expectations were were high, and the A's lived up to those expectations. And and Bob Melvin did a fantastic job keeping that team on point and having that team believe uh, they still had a lot of young, unproven guys on that team. And and uh, you know the. I was glad Billy brought back Cologne last year to, to see what he could do, and, and he turned out great. A lot of people were against that because they thought he was a cheater, but as it turned out, uh, Bart had a great year, and he's now with the Cleveland Indians. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the A's fan base, Rick. A's fans are one of the most radical and passionate in all of baseball. They also love challenges, and it's almost like they took it personal when the A's didn't open the third deck for the ALDS in 2012. So what do they do? They forced the A's to open up the third deck for the playoffs in 2013. Many A's fans feel disrespected by ownership and feel like they're not accurately portrayed by the national media. Describe, Rick, the state of the fan base now. Well, I mean, it's funny because, uh, you know, in in the 80s, the the A's were the the corporate team with the high payroll and the stars and the Giants were sort of the gritty, we play in a lousy ballpark, no one loves us, we stink. But we have true fans, and now it's completely the opposite. The the A's are supposed to play in this bad ballpark, even though I love it, and the Giants are the corporate team with the rings. It's it's just funny how it's completely flip flop. But there are a lot of fans in the Bay Area that go one side or the other. But you know, I think each side has a a core of about ten thousand fans that you know really stay loyal to the team. And you mentioned the Tarps. I mean. Think about FanFest. They announced yesterday that it's going to be in the Coliseum Arena and the Coliseum simultaneously. Three years ago, they had it in the parking lot on a weekday day game, which was a joke. Only people like me who have weird schedules could go. 
two years ago they had it in the arena last year in the arena as well so this year i think the demand as you mentioned not only getting the tarps down but you know it's nice to have it in the arena in case it rains and you've got some you know it's it's cool space but you got to have it in the baseball stadium too and i and i think the fans have been heard and you know rick when i remember the history of the a's ownership you know walter a haas founder of levi strauss purchased the a's in 1980 to keep the team in oakland and also so the team could become an asset to the community he also, in a kind-hearted gesture, gave the Giants territorial rights to San Jose so they could stay in the Bay Area. And it's interesting, Rick, that his kind-hearted gesture over 20 years ago has saved professional baseball in Oakland. They'd be in San Jose by now. Yeah, there's no doubt. It's crazy. And, you know, Walter Haas, you're talking about a um, somebody with, with love for the Bay Area. You're absolutely right, because this is a San Francisco family that, that thought it was important to keep it a, a two-team market, and that's the same thing he thought about with the with the Giants as well. And uh, bless his heart, he gave those territorial rights to the Giants, because otherwise, you're right, they'd be down there in San Jose right now. And you know what? I don't blame uh, the Giants, even though that was you know given to Corey Bush and Bob Lurie back in the day. I don't blame the the, the new Giants regime for holding on to those rights and, and fighting hard for them um, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, money down there. But um, you're right, had Walter A. Haas not done that. Uh, and remember, they, the Haas family has done a lot of things outside of baseball, too. I mean, if you talk about just playgrounds and libraries and a lot of things, they, the Haas family are proof that you can be rich, give away millions and millions of dollars, and remain rich. Because most people, some billionaires I know, are such penny pinchers, they think if they give away 10 cents, they're going to be poor. The voice you're hearing is Rick Tittle, on-air talent at 95.7 The Game. And I'd like, you, like to encourage you to like his Facebook page, Titillating Sports with Rick Tittle. It has a great deal of Bay Area sports commentary, including about your Oakland A's. He's also at, at Rick Tittle, R-I-C-K, T-I-T-T-L-E on Twitter. Rick, in lieu of the A's trades and acquisitions this offseason, what are, what are your expectations for this club? Well, I think it's going to be it's going to be fun. I mean, uh, they sort of made the decision no Balfour, no Columbus, so they spent more money than I thought they would on on Casimir. They're you know the arbitration still has to come in on Johnson, but he's probably going to get about ten mil, and he has over a hundred saves the last two years. Um, so I I think they're set there. I, there were some rumors that perhaps maybe they were in on Masahiro Tanaka. I don't think that's possible because I think they could pay the the twenty mil posting fee i don't think they'd want to pay him then another hundred million in contracts but the thing i don't like people saying is the a's already have enough pitching the a's don't have enough and anything if you want to be good you got to stockpile at every position um in the off season um you know picking up gentry for choice normally that would have been a trade that irked me but i was actually okay with it because uh, i think choice is going to be a good major leaguer they're talking about maybe even platooning him in texas with Sinchu chu which i think with all the money they gave to they're not going to do that. But I, I like choice a lot, but in a, in a hitters league, like the PCL last year, he hit 14 home runs. I mean, he still hit 300, but when you, when the A's drafted him, they look at a guy that was going to hit at least 20, if not 30. Um, so they probably thought we're not getting, we're not going to get the power out of him that we thought. And listen, it's way early. Uh, every time I saw Gentry play against the A's, the guy was scoring from first base on a grounder up the middle. The guy has tremendous speed, and maybe Coco's last year, that at least the A's have a, a fantastic defensive center fielder for next year. But you look in the outfield, Cespedes and left. Coco now, well, I think we'll get a lot of games at designated hitter now because Gentry can spell him and you can save Coco's legs. And uh, in right field, we'll see what's going on with Red. But I think that if you want to get Gentry in the lineup, I think maybe Brandon Moss's outfield days might be over. I think he's going to play a lot more first base. So that means, well, what do they do? With Fryman, Fryman is a 300 hitter, but he only, he didn't come as advertised as a slugger. What do you have? Four home runs, and then um, you got Barton, who's back, and um, Barton's going to play a lot more than the fans want him to play. So it's an interesting conundrum, but that's better than saying we have no one here and we have no one there, which the A's fans have gone through before. And Rick, it's January 8th. Ace pitchers and catchers report on Valentine's Day. What does that signify for you as an A's fan? That's by his love and baseball, I can't think of anything better than better Valentine's, better than a heart-shaped box of chocolate. I can tell you that, and it's just, 
you know, it's funny cause I, I was, football was always my number one sport as a kid. And I, you know, I played in high school and college and I coached a little bit too, but as I've gotten older, I enjoy baseball season a lot more because it's every day. And, and as a Raider fan, after 11 horrible years, you don't have to sit on a loss for a week. If the, if the ace closer blows a save and you have a horrible loss, you get right back out there the next day. And, you know, it's, it's warm. And I just, I really enjoy baseball season now more than football season. That's Rick Tittle. Rick, as always, thanks for your support, friendship, and uh, passion for the A's, man. Hey, Dale, uh, great website. And I'm glad you, uh, you're you keeping it going. So we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Take care. You know, I'll always remember people who have supported me through the years and partnered with me to provide you A's talk. Joe Stiglitz is one of them. Joe was a longtime A's beat writer for the Bay Area News Group and now covers the A's for Comcast Sports Net California. He's joining me right now. Stig, what's up, man? Not a whole lot. How you doing, Dale? Good to talk to you again. Yes. Tell, tell me about this transition from, from, from print media to TV, Joe. Well, you know, I mean, the majority of the job, I would say, is still is still writing, um, and, but there's some TV work to go along with it, which is um, a little bit different for me, and it's exciting for me because my whole background's always been in writing, you know. So, you know, I mean, the nuts and bolts of the job is still, um, you know, still covering the team as a beat writer and writing for Comcast website, but there's some some TV work mixed in there, too, and it's just another way of kind of, you know, talking about the A's, breaking it down, analyzing the team, and but doing it in front of cameras instead of, you know, in front of a laptop. So it's it's different. It's uh, been an exciting challenge, and I really enjoy it. Good gig. You know, I've just received word that Frank Thomas, former A's des- designated hitter who shouldered them to the ALCS in 2006, has been elected to the Hall of Fame, and the A's just released a statement. Uh, we congratulate Frank on joining the Immortals of Baseball well, he spent only two seasons with our organization. We had the distinct privilege to experience his greatness as a player and as a person. Beyond his special talents, Frank Thomas was the consummate professional who respected the game, his teammates, and his opponents, and he exhibited the kind of class every player should aspire to. He is richly deserving of his honor. The A's just re- released that statement. Uh, Joe, in lieu of the steroid era, the choices and non-selections have been interesting what do you remember most about Frank Thomas in an A's uniform, and what do you think helped him uh, get elected to Cooperstown? Well, you know, when you think about Frank Thomas, you think about this incredible long career he had, you know, back-to-back MVPs with the White Sox and over 500 career homers. But, you know, when you think back to his time with the A's, you got to remember when he first joined them in 06, what a, what, a, what a downtime in his career he was coming off of. It was a couple of really – subpar years for him with the White Sox where he was he was injured a lot and the numbers just weren't the same I mean he had been a shell of his former self was last couple of years of Chicago he comes with the A's he signs with the A's just looking to kind of bounce back and reestablish himself and I mean what a year he had in that 06 season like you said a MVP caliber season I think he was fourth in AL MVP voting that year really anchored their lineup and helped carry them um, all the way to the ALCS that year so it was just a great, I mean, the A's just hit on it. It was a great pickup for them, and it was really good for Frank to kind of resurrect his career. And, you know, didn't have the same success when he came back to Oakland in 08, but, I mean, his entire body of work is what got him into the Hall of Fame. And he's never really been, never at all been connected to PED use in an era where a lot of guys were. And so those numbers were pretty legitimate. And across the board, they're just fantastic numbers and kind of a no-brainer that he got in. Let's talk about the A's offseason, Joe. There's some light buzz that the A's could be in the running for Japanese pitcher Masahiro Tanaka. I hope I pronounced that right. Who went 24-0 with a 1.27 ERA last season for the Rakuten Golden Eagles. You wrote about that possibility for CSN Bay Area on Monday. And you basically wrote that it wouldn't shock you if they were in the running. Yeah, you know, I'm from, a, from a purely baseball standpoint, um, I mean, it makes all the sense in the world for a lot of teams to be interested in him, including the A's, because, you know, the A's have a, a pretty deep rotation. It's a solid rotation, and it's a starting staff that I think a lot of teams would, would love to have. At the same time, you know, I don't know if there's a, a dominant top of the rotation, shut down ace type guy. I don't know if you'd label any of those guys that way yet. And, you know, who knows if Tanaka's going to be that guy, but people sure are saying great stuff about him, and he's had the track record in Japan, and he's highly coveted over here. I mean, we're seeing a lot of teams associated with him, so. Um, there's been some buzz that the A's, uh, the A's are, have some interest in him, or they could be a surprise contender for him. Um, he's going to cost an awful lot of money, obviously. I mean, there, there are people saying that 
it may take a hundred million dollar contract to land him. And if that's the case, you know, it's it's tough to imagine the A's probably being the team to get him when there's some deep pocketed teams going after him. But but you never know. I've learned with this team you never count anything out with this team. Whenever you think they've got them, whenever you think you've got the A's figured out, they surprise you with the move. You know, and we all know how active they are on the international front. They scout international guys pretty hard. So certainly they've done their homework on Tanaka. We'll see if anything comes with it, but uh, like I said, never say never. And of course, Joe, one of the trades being pulled off this offseason was Brett Anderson to the Rockies for Drew Pomeranz and, and minor league pitcher Chris Jensen. It's interesting when you p- reflect on Anderson's time with the A's. I mean, he was considered the A the ace entering the 2010 season, and I thought he was better than Cahill and Gonzalez. He got the nice contract, but the guy just couldn't stay healthy, Joe. Yeah, he really couldn't, and it was a shame for the A's because we kind of saw glimpses of what he can do when he was healthy. Uh, I mean, you're right. He was he had that shutdown type stuff. We saw it a little bit in the 2012 postseason and the one start he made mm-hmm. against Detroit. He did so well. Um, he just couldn't really stay healthy, you know. And on the flip side, if your other team's looking at Brett, you could see why they'd be tempted to go after him because of that upside that potentially he still has, you know. And, and the A's are in a position, you know, they've got enough rotation depth where they could – go ahead and deal a guy like that who's had really tough injury luck for them, wasn't doing the job really for them, um, but he has some value in the eyes of other teams. So they went ahead and made that deal, and and we'll see. I think it's going to take a couple of years to see how that deal works out for the A's with, with Drew Pomerantz, and, and they got a single-A pitcher, uh, Chris Jensen, along with Pomerantz. And Pomerantz is obviously the big, the marquee guy they got in that deal. He's a left-hander. He's had a, he's a very highly touted prospect, but has not really put it together at the big league level. We'll see if he can do it with the A's. They like him as a starting pitcher. Um, I don't think he'll be in the rotation to start the season, but I think the A's would like to see him put it together, um, get on top of his game, and eventually enter that rotation at some point. And besides the Anderson trade, uh, Joe, the A's have made a flurry of moves this offseason. Yeah, but, sure but by no means were they flashy. Uh, they acquired closer Jim uh, Johnson to replace Balfour. They signed Casimir and trade for Gentry. But there's always a feeling, Joe, that, that the A's are in their own world and they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, definitely. They've been, you know, and, and when last season ended, I think everybody thought, I think we all thought, you know, it might be sort of an inactive winner for them because they seem to have so many pieces in place. And here, you know, they were the busiest team in the month of December, I'd say, as far as the moves they made. Um, and they always seem to surprise us like that. You know, they're always looking to do something to improve. And um, I think when you look at the the moves they made as a whole, you probably look at the bullpen in particular, and, and the pieces they added with Jim Johnson as closer and, and Luke Gregerson, a, a really good setup, man, they got from San Diego sure. for Seth Smith. Um, they really kind of added some depth to that bullpen. It was already a pretty strong bullpen, but, you know, they lost Grant Balfour. We knew when the season ended, Balfour was probably headed elsewhere. Uh, I think Grant knew that also. The A's knew that. So they needed to add somebody to that ninth inning mix. They went out and traded for Jim Johnson. And uh, we'll see how it goes, but you got to like the numbers they have just as far as the quality arms they got down there and the depth. They really took a, a part of the team that was a strength for them, and they made it even stronger. And, of course, Tim Hudson, a former Braves pitcher and former A's pitcher, was uh, on the market this offseason, and the A's were uh, contending to, to sign him. How surprised were you that uh, he chose to sign with the Giants instead of his former team? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, he's familiar with the Bay Area, obviously, so I'm not surprised he was interested in both teams, but I think he just looks at the Giants and what they've been able to accomplish the past couple of years as far as winning the World Series titles, and I think staying in the National League was a big thing for him, and the chance to pitch in a pitcher's park, AT&T Park probably um, appealed to him also. And obviously, Oakland has a, has a good pitcher's park, and Tim's very familiar with it, um, but, you know, he's been in the National League for a lot of years now, and staying in the National League allows him to just, you know, he doesn't have to learn a whole new set of hitters and everything. And I think overall the comfort of going to San Francisco is just probably pretty high for him. Um, the A's did, the A's made an aggressive, you know, run at him financially, you know, and he just decided to go with the Giants. So um, after the A's went after him like that, it wasn't a huge surprise to see them throw a lot of money at another veteran starting pitcher in Scott Casimir because they needed to get somebody to replace, you know, Bartolo Colon and, and Casimir, you know, could be seen as a little bit of a question mark with his, you know, the past few years, even though he's pretty solid with Cleveland last year. We'll see if he can do the job, though. But the A's definitely wanted Tim Hudson. Would have been a really great story had, had you know, Huddy come back and, and wore the green and gold again, but not to be. The voice you're hearing is Joe Stiglitz, who covers uh, the A's for Comcast Sports Bay Area. You can follow him, him on Twitter at, at Joe Stiglitz. 
at J-O-E-S-T-I-G-L-I-C-H. Speaking of another move, uh, Joe, the A signed Derek Barton to a one-year deal a few weeks ago, and it seemed like he was a part of the Mark Mulder deal in like 1988. <laughs> how, You're right. how has this guy managed to stay in this organization for some 10 years? Yeah, it's been it's been a pretty it's been an interesting ride of his to follow. Um, for one thing, the guy he doesn't have a, enough service time in yet to be really expensive, so it's been pretty affordable to keep him around um, as depth at first base. You know, when he hangs around in the minor leagues, and if there's a need up in the big leagues, the A's brought him up, and we saw it last year. You know, I mean, who would have thought that he would have played a somewhat you know key role for the team down the stretch when they really kind of heated up offensively and took control of the division. Um, but Derek was a big part of that. I mean, he he earned that playing time. You got to you got to admit he earned that playing time when he came back up. I believe it was in late August when Josh Reddick went on the DL, and um, he hit pretty good for a stretch. So much so that Brandon Moss they decided to give him at bats in the outfield uh, just to keep Derek in the lineup a little bit. And we all know the A's like his on base ability, but I mean he hit. He showed a little bit more aggressiveness at times last year too, which you know Bob Melvin has said is a little bit of a key for him um, to keep getting playing time. So. You know, he'll be at spring camp again this year, and it looks like numbers-wise it's going to be tough to, to crack the opening day roster for sure. Brandon Moss is definitely the guy at first base, and they have Nate Fryman as a right-handed uh, hitting option at first base. So it's an uphill battle for Derek, but it's, it's nothing new for him, and, and we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Joe, uh, any uh, articles coming on uh, CSM Bay Area that you're uh, releasing, covering? You know what, I've been doing a series just looking at each position and breaking it down a little bit. Um, so far I've done the pitching staff and – catcher first base second base so i'm just going around the diamond and in the next couple of weeks i'll be finishing that off looking at each position a little bit looking at, at this season and maybe what the a's have come through the pipeline and the farm system at each position and um it's fun kind of doing that it kind of gets me ready for the season coming up and hopefully gives readers a chance to you know refresh themselves and and get up to speed on on this year's ace team so Spring training is going to be here before you know it, man. It's, it's exciting. It's almost here. That's Joe Stiglitz. Joe, as always, great reporting and insight, and I'm very happy I still get to follow your coverage with Comcast. All right, Dale. Thanks for having me on. Moving right along, of course, the goal of my podcast is to provide you with quality talk and interviews that celebrates the past and embraces the future of A's baseball. My first guest, Dave Stewart, talked about the La Russa legacy with the A's. My next guest, Rick Tittle, discussed the passion of our fan base. Then Joe Stiglitz provided us some nuts and bolts about the A's offseason. My next guest is one of the most dynamic reporters around. Melissa Lockhart covers the future of the Oakland A's. Her website, oaklandclubhouse.com, has the most comprehensive information on A's prospects around. And I'm thrilled to have her on the show today. Melissa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Melissa, first of all, what is the state of the A's farm system right now? Well, it's definitely uh, a little bit down, mostly because a lot of the guys that uh, have graduated over the last two years have moved through the system pretty quickly. Your Sonny Grays and A.J. Griffin have come up and made a big impact at the major league level within just a couple of years of being drafted. So certainly when that happens, you, you tend to have a void because your draft classes get sent out pretty quickly. Um, they, they also had a few trades this offseason where – uh, some of their top prospects were dealt away for, uh, you know, talent that's going to help the 2014 team. Um, so when that happens, again, you're going to see a dip in the overall talent level. But there certainly are uh, several players that are, are worth watching, including one of the top prospects in all of baseball and Addison Russell. Sure. And let's talk about some A's, former A's first round draft picks who were dealt in the matter of days. Michael Choice, the 10th overall pick in 2010, and Jamal Weeks, the 12th overall pick in 2008. Choice was traded to the Rangers in the Gentry trade, and Weeks went to the Orioles in the Jim Johnson trade. You followed their journey in the A's farm system, Melissa. How surprised were you to see them dealt? I wasn't all that surprised to see Weeks traded, only because I just think the path for him in Oakland had sort of dried up, and he needed a change of scenery, and hopefully he'll have an opportunity in Baltimore to get some playing time and uh, really allow his skill set to, to play out at the big, big league level. But um, with Choice, I was surprised only because I really saw him as someone who was going to move right into that role that Chris Young played last year, filling in all three outfield spots and, and being that right-handed hitter against left-handed pitching. Um, but they've always obviously addressed that role a little bit differently in bringing in another right-handed hitter in Gentry. 
uh, and more of a true center fielder than perhaps Choice is. But I think Choice has a chance to be a very good big league player. Uh, and the A's are going to see a lot of him, you know, playing in Texas. It's in his backyard. He grew up in Arlington. So uh, I think, you know, all in all, both parties are probably pretty happy with what they got. But I definitely was uh, surprised to see Choice traded. Mm, let's talk some, about some of the prospects the A's acquired this offseason. I'm hearing a lot of buzz about left-handed pitcher Drew Pomeranz, who was acquired, mm-hmm. acquired from the Rockies in the Brent Anderson trade. What can you tell us about him, and where do you see him fitting in on the pitching staff? Well, you know, he's a real wild card. Uh, it's a very interesting situation with him. He was the fifth overall pick in 2010 out of Ole Miss. Uh, you know, was one of the SEC's top pitchers, and that's one of the top college baseball conferences in the nation. So, um, you know, he came in with a huge profile. He moved up really quickly through the Indian system, was then traded for Abdallah Jimenez. Um, and reached the big leagues by the mid- midway through the 2011 season and was really one of the top pitching prospects in all of baseball at that point. Uh, but, you know, it's not easy to pick uh, pitch in Colorado, and he had some trouble um, pitching in uh, Coors Field and, and seemed to shy away from trying to throw his fastball as hard as he could, uh, did a lot more pitching with his secondary offerings, and it really hurt his overall game. Uh, his command suffered, his uh, miles per hour on his fastball dipped, and he never really looked all that comfortable with the Rockies. At the end of last year, he came up right at the end of the season as a reliever and actually pitched pretty well out of the bullpen. So it'll be interesting to see if the A's view him as a starter, that they can kind of get back to where he was in 2011, 2012, or whether they see him as someone who's going to go into the bullpen and concentrate on just his fastball and curveball and uh, you know carve up left-handed pitchers, uh, left-handed hitters that way. But um, there's a lot of talent there, and it wasn't that long ago that he was a guy that really – maybe a team would want to use as a building block for their entire rotation. So, uh, you know, given the A's history with developing pitchers, he could end up being a big steal for them. Another prospect the A's acquired is Billy Burns, a speedy outfielder who was named the Nationals Nationals Minor League Player of the Year in 2013. He was acquired in the Jerry Blevins trade, of course. He's 24 years old, 5'9", 180 pounds. What made him so attractive to the A's, Melissa? Well, he, you know, David Forrest told me that uh, he, he has one of the most unique skill sets in the minor leagues and that he uh, was one of only three players to have a, a 400, uh, 400 on base percentage and 50 plus steals last season. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's extremely fast, like uh, one of the fastest guys in all of minor league baseball, um, but also steals bases at a very, very high rate with 91.5% last year. So he stole 74 bases and 80 chances, which is really just a remarkable percentage, um, even if, you know, for someone who's as fast as he is. So he's a smart base runner, but he has the speed to rack up huge numbers that way. And he really controls the strike zone well. He has a very short um, swing. He he chokes up both sides of the plate and uh, just works his way on base by grounding balls uh, to the opposite side of the infield and beating out base hits, uh, dropping down bunts, hitting line drives. It doesn't have very much power at all, so it'll be interesting to see how that talent plays out when he gets to AAA in the big leagues when, you know, scouting reports will start to crowd him a little bit in, in the outfield. But, um, you know, brings that press, plus speed and athleticism to the organization that can be hard to find in baseball. Uh, and, you know, he's just a, a true burner athlete like you might see in the NFL. Let's talk about sweet swinging Billy McKinney, the ace first round pick last season, Melissa. I love his swing and he looks like a decent outfielder as well. How's his progress so far in the short time uh, he's been in the A's organization? Well, he's really made a lot of improvements, even just from when he signed. You know, he he got off to a bit of a slow start in the Arizona Rookie League and uh, just sort of adjusting to the the speed of the game and, you know, the talent level that he was facing on the mound as compared to when he was in high school. Um, But he caught up with the pitching pretty quickly and had a very strong end to his season, both with a – the Arizona Fall or the Arizona Rookie League team and uh, the Vermont Lake Monsters in the short season league, and uh, you know he's he's got a lot of overall all around skills where he he hits for average, he can get on base, he's got a little bit of power, he's got a little bit of speed, plays center field pretty well, has a decent arm, so he can do everything pretty well. And the question will be whether he has a particular tool that uh, develops as a really standout tool, or whether he's going to just be one of these guys that just does a lot of things. Um, uh, you know, on an average to slightly above average uh, basis. But, you know, he's definitely, I, I've heard a lot of people describe him as just a really good ball player. And uh, I think he's somebody that the A's are going to um, enjoy watch develop. And he may not move as quickly as uh, Addison Russell the year before, but I think he is somebody that uh, should move along in the system at a pretty steady pace. The voice you're hearing is Melissa Lockhart, senior editor at OaklandClubhouse.com. You can follow her on Twitter at, at OakClubhouse. That's O A K clubhouse 
Uh, of course, in 2008, Melissa, the ace signed a 16-year-old towering pitcher, Michael Yanoa, from the Dominican Republic for $4.25 million. He had Tommy John surgery in 2010, which set him back. When could we start talking about seeing him in, the, in an A's uniform? Well, actually, we're going to have to start talking about him sooner than maybe he and the A's would like in some respects because he was added to the 40-man roster before last season because of the way that the Rule 5 draft um, uh, rules lay out. So he only has two more option years before he's going to be out of options. So this year is going to be a very critical year for his development. He reached the high A level for the first time um, last year. He had some struggles towards the end of the season, but his stuff looked good all, all year. He was relatively healthy all year. He pitched well in the fall league, uh, in the fall instructional league. So uh, there was a lot to build off of last year, but um, 2014, he's really going to have to make that jump up and, and probably reach the double-A level if re- realistically he can pitch in a starting rotation in the big leagues. Uh, otherwise, you know, if he, if he ends up in high-A all year, they may have to look to move him to the bullpen in order to speed up his development fast enough to get him to the big leagues before he's out of options. So um, it's a very interesting dynamic that comes with these players that get signed when they're only 16 years old, that they could be 21, 22, and you're already talking about counting option years, but uh, he's a tremendous talent. His fastball was, you know, above 95 for most of the year. He's got a dynamic breaking ball. He's got some feel for a changeup, and, you know, his the way that his height works, it's very intimidating for a hitter to stand in there against him. So the talent is definitely everything everybody had talked about, and it's just going to be whether he can put it all together in time to make an impact with the A's. Shifting our attention to another uh, A's prospect, A's farm had Addison Russell. He's receiving some national attention as a talented shortstop prospect. How much of a can't-miss prospect is he, Melissa? Well, he's definitely the best prospect, hands down, that I've covered since I've been covering the team, and it's been 10 wow. years. And I th- Yeah, easily. And, and I think I think back to Eric Chavez probably um, is as is, is far back as you're going to look at a talent like him coming through the A system. He uh, does everything well. He's a good defender. He's got a strong arm. He's extremely athletic. He's fast. He hits for power. He hits for average. He can take, you know, good – amount of pitches at the top of an order. Um, and he's just got a really good head about him. You know, he's he doesn't get too far ahead of himself. He works hard every day. He listens to his coaches. He makes adjustments. And he just seems like the kind of guy that's going to reach his potential uh, because he's not going to throw it away. He's really focused on on getting there. And, um, you know, every challenge the A's have given him, he's he's been able to meet head on. And I think the best thing about last year was that he got off to a really slow start with Stockton, but he played through it and he didn't give up. He didn't get frustrated and he ended up finishing that year with one of the best years in the Cal League. So, uh, you know, I think that showed a lot of maturity for a kid who wasn't even 20 years old yet to to be able to fight through that kind of uh, very high-profile struggle um, and, you know, get get through a season and really put together some amazing numbers. So um, he's a really exciting guy to watch. I think he's a guy that we may see in the big leagues, you know, right around his 21st, 22nd birthday and uh, could be the you know future of the franchise for a very long time. As always, great stuff, Melissa. A's fans are very fortunate to have you as you continue to provide fantastic coverage on the A's farm system. Thanks very much. And thank you, Ace fans, for joining me on this special off-season episode of Athletics Talk. Now, I hope we were able to provide you with your off-season A's fix. Don't forget to visit our website, athleticstalknow.com, and listen to every podcast on iTunes. Just search Athletics Talk Now. Happy New Year, Ace fans.